to those questions are yes or no, correct? Uh, I believe so. True or false? Oh. Um, yes, no, true, false. Always, sometimes, no, never. So that's are the choices. Uh, yes. Now, um, in the Beck Youth Inventory that you administered, they are there's a hundred true and false questions, correct? There are a hundred never, sometimes, often, always questions. And um, with the M MNPIA, there are over 400 questions, correct? Correct. And the responses are true, false? Correct. And um, with the SEERS, which is the Structured Interview of Reported Symptoms, um, there are varying answer selections, correct? Yes. And um, one section is no answer, no, sometimes, definitely yes. Oh, I see what you mean by no answer, uh, yes. And one section is no answer, no, yes, unbearable. One section is no, yes, unbearable, yes. I don't know if I asked you about the basic to the SRP. That's 176 true and false? No, that has two sections, oh, okay. some of which are true, false, and some of which have graded responses. Um, if I can find it, I'll tell you what those graded responses are. Uh, never, sometimes, often, always. Now, I've already asked you this, but you administered the Miller Forensic Assessment Symptom Test to Philip Chisholm, is that correct? I did. And um, there is a manual for that test? There is. And you're acquainted with the manual? I am. And the manual has a section that reads, Appropriate Populations and Test Limits, correct? Uh, well, I don't have the, the manual memorized, but that sounds like a section you would see in the manual. May I approach? Sure. And while you're approaching the uh, witness, I'll just ask Ms. McDougall, is, uh, is, are you still making the same request as to the court discussing the issue of an order with the uh, doctor, the issue you raised yesterday? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Need a bonus of caution. okay, I'll do that when the court, before the courtroom is closed. Do you recognize that as the, uh, per the professional manual? I recognize it as a portion of the manual. And in fact, uh, the manual has a section, Appropriate Populations and Test Limitations, correct? It does. And in that portion of the manual, it says, the MFAS is attended for use with adults age 18 and old, or older, correct? 18 years or older, yes, it says that. It also says, the MFAST has not been validated for children or adolescents under the age of 18 years, correct? It does, yes. 
And continuing on, it says, although the validity of the MFAST has not been established with these groups, researchers have found that malingering instruments such as the SEERS are capable of identifying malingering in adults. Because of its similarity to the SEERS, it's very possible that the MFAST is a valid indicator of malingering in adolescents. Although clinicians and researchers may use the MFAST with children or adolescents on an exper experimental basis, further research is required to establish the validity of MFAST results before clinical decisions based on this instrument can be made with such populations. Correct? Well, actually, you read um, uh, por a portion of it incorrectly. Why don't you read the portion that I read incorrectly? You said that, uh, you said researchers have found uh, that malingering instruments such as the Sears are capable of identifying malingering in adults and it actually reads adolescents. Oh, I apologize. So let's read that sentence over again. Although the validity of the MFAST has not been established with these groups, researchers have found that malingering instruments such as the Sears are capable of identifying malingering in adolescents, correct? Correct. <clears throat> Your Honor, at this time my questions will be about the content of a test. All right. At this point in time, uh, the court is going to uh, close the courtroom only for the questions. Uh, and before, the, before I close, before anybody leaves, uh, there's anything I can say that doesn't require the courtroom to be closed, it won't be closed for. Uh, Ms. Regan, um, to the extent that, uh, that you're going to ask a question in this series, as awkward as it is, that doesn't reference back, I'm going to have to do the back and forth of having... Um, uh, people come back in. And um, uh, Dr. Heaven, um, I, I recognize uh, the proprietary and ethical issues um, that were proffered by the, um, uh, to the court, and so I'm ordering you to answer these questions. Okay, uh, you're ready now, Ms. Regan? Yes. Okay, the courtroom will be uh, uh, temporarily closed for just these questions. Do severely mentally ill people, in your opinion, have increased ringing in their ears when under stress? I have no opinion about that. Do you have a copy of your report? Yes. I'd like to ask you questions about the MMPIA test that you gave to Philip. I direct your attention to page 14. I'm going to read the paragraph or parts, a few sentences, and you tell me if I'm reading it correctly. The re, uh, beginning with the second paragraph. 
The results from Phillips' validity scale from the MMPIA were also consistent with feigning of mental disorders, correct? Correct. Although his F index was less than 85T, i.e. 83T, his FK index was highly elevated at 23, correct? It's F minus K index. Overall, according to the interpretive report from the MMPA, MMPIA, Phillips' response to the MMPIA items were more extreme and exaggerated than those in most adolescents. Did I read that right? Than those of most adolescents. He endorsed a wide variety of extreme symptoms, correct? Correct. These symptoms may include psychotic thoughts or behaviors, alcohol or other drug-related problems, eating difficulties, extreme family discord, or problematic interpersonal relationships, correct? Correct. He may be exaggerating his symptoms as a plea for help, correct? Correct. Directing your attention to the top of page 15. Just want to remind uh, members of the audience that the only people who can be on their uh, cell phones are uh, credentialed members of the media or those registered under uh, SJC Rule 119. All right, directing your attention to page 15, top paragraph. With the caution of an exaggerated report of pathology in mind, Phillips' endorsements on the MMI slash A resulted in the following interpretation. In terms of symptomatic behavior, acutely disturbed behavior tends to characterize adolescents with this clinical profile. Did I read that correct? You left out the P in MMPIA, but otherwise, yes. Okay. This person is likely to be experiencing difficulty as a result of his poor impulse control, correct? You read that correctly, yes. Because he tends to act out unpredictably <clears throat> in sometimes bizarre or destructive ways, he is probably having problems at this time, correct? Correct. He may have unrealistic or grandiose plans and he may be delusional, correct? You read that correctly. Now directing your attention to the paragraph <coughs> at the end of page 15. An examination of Phillips' underlying personality factors with the MMPIA PSY-5 scales, if his responses could be taken as accurate, indicate he apparently holds some unusual beliefs <coughs> that suggest he may be somewhat disengaged from reality. Correct? You read that correctly, yes. Yeah. His high score on psychoticism scale, 97T, suggests he often feels alienated from others and may experience unusual symptoms such as delusional beliefs, <coughs> circumstantial and tangential thinking, and loosening of associations. Correct? Except you said may instead of might, but yes. Okay. Let's go to page 16 of your report, third paragraph down. <coughs> you wrote, 
in terms of diagnostic considerations for this MMPI-A, some adolescents with this <coughs> clinical profile are considered to have personality problems. However, the possibility of schizophrenia should be ruled out. Philip reports numerous bizarre thoughts and behaviors. If these experiences cannot be explained by alcohol or other drug intoxication, organic problems, a misunderstanding of these items, or an intentional exaggeration of psychopathology, a psychotic process should be considered. Correct? You read that correctly. Someone else, not you, correct? Objection? I can rephrase it. You can have a beer of inquiry, but based on Commonwealth versus Chapel, um, is it to the characterization of the question? All right, sustain. But you can have the area of inquiry, but I'll um, sustain objection to the characterization of the testimony. You testified that Philip Chisholm took a whisk for in 2013? Now, you're aware that Mr. Chisholm took an intelligence test or an IQ, uh, a test of cognitive ability, we'll call it to be precise, the WISC-4 
in March of 2014? I am aware of that, yes. And his scores were in the normal range? Um, some of his scores were in the high average range. All of his scores were within the normal range, yes. Now, um, he also, um, you received some test data concerning uh, WMS4. I'm not sure what, is that called the Wechsler or? That's the Wechsler Memory Scale 4th edition, edition. And that's a, a test similar things to the WISC, is that right? Uh, the Wexler Memory Scale is a test of learning and memory. The WISC-4 is a test of intelligence. Now, on the, um, the Wexler test, Philip did quite poorly, correct? They're both Wexler tests. Okay. So on the WISC-4, he scored normally. When he was given um, the Wexler and two subtests from the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Adults, um, the fourth edition of that, um, he scored below the first percentile on tests that he had scored in the high average range uh, the year before. And how many subtests are in the um, later test that was given? In the, if the test, the test in full, the later test, where he only was given two subtests, how, what is a full test? How many subtests does it have? If you're giving the core part of the test, there are optionals that you can add. There are ten subtests. And only two were given? Yes, only two were given. As far as I can tell, that's all I received. I wasn't there, so I don't know for certain. I could have a moment. Sure. Uh, Your Honor, I'm done. Okay. Give me the last thing to do. Dr. Heaven, I believe um, ultimately you've testified that you administered seven tests. Is that correct? Yes, I believe that's correct. And it was elicited on cross-examination that five of those seven tests were positive for malingering. Is that correct? Um, Two were effort and the other five showed up positive for malingering. Is that correct? There are no, um, sub no, there are no symptom validity scales on the Beck Youth Inventory, so I would have to say uh, four. four. Okay. So let me ask you this, though. The two, um, the MMPIA that you administered, is the primary purpose of that test to test for malingering? No, it's not. What is the primary purpose of the MMPIA? To get an assessment of uh, whether or not there's psychopathology, to get a sense of a person's um, uh, emotional report, somatic report. Um, it's really to, to assist in diagnosis. And Ms. Um, Regan elicited from your report um, some of the, sim the symptoms that were reported in MMPIA, which included the possibility, uh, such that the possibility of schizophrenia should be ruled out. Is that correct? Uh, she did, yes. Okay. But in fact, can you even get that far with evaluating those responses on the MMPIA? No, you cannot because the symptom validity tests contained within there um, indicated that the profile was invalid as an accurate representation of his state of, of, of personality, psychopathology at that point in time, and that was actually contained in one of the sentences that Ms. Reagan read out loud. Um, <coughs> because if he's reporting every symptom or too many symptoms or a number of symptoms that um, don't appear together in a person who's genuinely mentally ill, then you can't um, credit those symptoms. Is that correct? Objection leading. It is. Um, um, I'll, um, I'll sustain it. Um, well, Ms. Regan um, had read to you the sentence 
After the part about the possibility of schizophrenia, Philip reported numerous bizarre thoughts and behaviors. If these experiences cannot be explained by alcohol or other drug intoxication, organic problems, a misunderstanding of the items, or an intentional exaggeration of psychopathology, a psychotic process should be considered. And that's on page 16 of your report that Ms. Regan read you. Is that correct? That's correct. And in this um, case, the did the test flag for any of those particular alternatives? Yes. In what was that? Intentional exaggeration of psychopathology. And again, with respect to the BASC, is the primary purpose of the BASC to test for malingering? No, it is not. Um, and <clears throat> were you able, but did you come across um, an issue in the validity scales of the BASC? Yes. And again, what was that? Um, excessive negativity and fake, a tendency toward fake bad. Um, so again, to the extent the BASC should give you a reading of um, negative symptoms, etc., were you able to trust those? No. Um, and then the test that you did for malingering, what were the results of those tests? The tests that are specifically designed to assess feigning of mental illnesses were both positive for feigning of mental illness. And doctor, you were asked some questions about the number of questions involved in total and the number of hours you spent with Mr. Chisholm without a break, is that correct? Yes. Do you remember <coughs> when in that time frame you did the test that tests for effort? Um, the tests for effort were, I can't be certain, but probably closer to the beginning. Okay. And certainly the tests for effort were the tests that Mr. Chisholm tested normal on, is that correct? Correct. The dots and the uh, toms, is that correct? The tom, yes. Tom. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you were asked some questions about um, whether mentally ill people actually experience, severely mentally ill people actually experience ringing in their ears, is that correct? I was asked a question, yes. And in fact, um, is there a reason that a symptom would be suggested in that particular test and then followed up on? Yes. What is that reason? Because sometimes when you suggest a symptom to someone, um, they will then, and you um, were to inform them that this is something that someone with a severe mental illness would do, they will then display that symptom for you to demonstrate that they have a severe mental illness. And in fact, with respect to that particular question, the defendant endorsed that symptom, didn't he? Objection. Um, well, it, 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 I, I suppose it's, it, it's leading, but it's, it's a response to the uh, cross. But if your objection is leading, I'll sustain it, although it's academic, I well, think. Well, I'd like to be heard. Sure. Mm
<coughs> Dr. Heaven, the um, two Wexler tests that were just discussed, do you administer, have you administered those tests yourself on other people, not the defendant? Thousands of times. Okay. And what, you've sort of given us a lesson in the different kind of testing you did, you do, what kinds, how would you characterize those two tests? What kinds of tests are they? The Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children, fourth edition, is a measure of intelligence that you give to children and adolescents. The Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, fourth edition, is an intelligence test that you give to adults. And understanding one is for adolescents and children and one is for adults, would you expect a dramatic difference in the results of those two tests? No, the tests are highly correlated. And um, would you, does it make sense to you as someone who administers these tests that even on two areas, someone's tests from, should go from the average to high average to below the first percentile? in over a year? Um, it does not make any sense at all. It should not happen um, and there is likely, in the absence of any kind of significant horror, horrible brain event, um, there is only one explanation. And what is that explanation? person was purposely feigning that they were unable to do now cognitive tests. And with respect to, if you were giving someone this test, knowing how they did on the Wexler a year earlier, would you have continued the testing if you had gotten these results in these two areas? I would have continued the testing, correct. But in this case, to the best of your knowledge, only two areas were tested on and they tested it below the first percentile. From what I saw from the raw test data, only two subtests from the WACE4 were administered. The first two. And to be clear, the first set of testing you received on the Wexler was from March of 14 and the second set from June 25th of 2015. Yes, I think the first one was uh, March 18th, 2014 was when the children's um, IQ test was given. Would you expect someone with genuine um, testing below the first percentile on those two areas of the adult version to be functioning in an academic setting or functioning particularly in the world? No, those scores would put someone in the le at the level of intellectually disabled, which is the term now used in place of mental retardation. I have nothing further for this one. Anything from the uh, redirect for us, Ms. Regan? Ladies and gentlemen, you've probably figured out by now that the redirect is limited to the, what happened on cross and the recross is limited to what happened on redirect. You were not present for the testing you just talked about, correct? No, all I had were the raw test data which demonstrated the way uh, but you, Mr. No, Chisholm that's not responded. My question. my question is, you were not present for the testing, correct? That's correct. Now, um, and you've concluded based on the test results that um, Mr. Chisholm was feigning, correct? I have, yes. And it also could have been a deliberate sabotage by an adolescent who just didn't want to take the test, correct? Well, that would be feigning. And you have no idea if Mr. Chisholm was sick that day, correct? Your Honor, can we be seen at sidebar? Sure.
Any uh, regret? Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Carmel's uh, next witness, please. Carmel calls Dr. Robert Hinscher. So if you stop right there and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the cause now and hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. You may be seated. Sir, come up. <coughs> Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Your Honor. It's been a motion to sequester witnesses in the case, so until the evidence is over, you can only be in the court when you testify and not talk about your testimony or the other witnesses. Well, let them talk about the answer. I understand, Your Honor. Right. Thank you. Ms. McDougall, please. Good morning, Dr. Kinsherf. In a loud, clear voice, can you state your first and last names, please? Robert Kinsherf. And can you spell your first and your last name? Robert, R O B E R T. Kinsherf, K I N S C H E R F F. Dr. Kinsherf, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed primarily at uh, William James College, which is a graduate school of psychology uh, here in the Boston area. I'm there as an associate vice president. My portfolio of responsibilities are the programs at our school that uh, provide direct services to people. I'm also on the faculty of the doctoral program in clinical psychology and also on the teaching faculty of the school psychology program. And Dr. James, uh, Dr. Kinsherf, can you briefly describe for us your educational background, please? I received my bachelor's degree in uh, political science and uh, social sciences at the University of California at Berkeley in 1972. Received a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Chicago in 1980. My PhD in clinical psychology with a child emphasis from the City University of New York in 1988. And my law degree from Harvard Law School in 1992. And Doctor, do you work primarily at this time as a psychologist or as a doctor or some combination thereof? Um, almost all of my uh, practice is as a, as, as a psychologist. And specifically um, with respect to your uh, employment in areas of psychology, can you describe for us, let me ask you this, how long have you been in your current position at William James? In my current position since uh, 2012, I believe. And where were you employed full time before that? Uh, prior to that time um, I had been employed also at William James College but also but not as a senior administrator I was the director of forensic uh, services uh, for that period of time and I had whole, held positions um, at Easter Seals of New Hampshire um, and while also acting as a consultant on juvenile court clinics to the administrative office of the juvenile court and specifically with respect to your duties at Easter Seals of New Hampshire, what type of an agency is the Easter Seals of New Hampshire and what were your responsibilities? Easter Seals of New Hampshire is a large social and clinical services provider. I was the director of clinical services. My responsibilities there included clinical oversight for a uh, residential treatment program for children and a, uh, a risk assessment and management uh, uh, program for the for the agency 
Now, um, Doctor, you indicated <coughs> in that time you were also doing some work for the Office of the Trial Court for the Juvenile Court Clinic. Is that correct? That's correct. And in fact, how long have you done work of a variety of types for the Juvenile Court Clinic? I first became involved with the Juvenile Court Clinic in 1985 and for a time was a staff member there. I subsequently became the Director of Juvenile Court Clinic Services in the Administrative Office of the Juvenile Court and served in that role from about uh, 1998 or 1999 until 2005 uh, when I left for uh, service at the Department of Mental Health. In that particular job at the Department of Mental Health, I also had a, an ongoing uh, professional relationship with the Administrative Office of the Juvenile Court because the Department of Mental Health and the trial court jointly administer the Juvenile Court Clinic services. And in my role as an assistant commissioner at DMH, that was within my job responsibilities. And um, with your work for the juvenile court, juvenile court, have you done evaluations of a r different kinds for the juvenile court clinic? Yes, I have. What types of evaluations have you done? I've done evaluations in uh, delinquency matters, uh, child abuse and neglect, uh, status offender matters, children who are uh, runaway, truant, uh, stubborn. I've seen a range of cases uh, over the years from uh, very, very minor truancy cases to homicide cases. And Dr. Kinsherf, when you would do, uh, when you've done evaluations through the juvenile court clinic, are they for a party, meaning um, one side or the other, or are they f uh, at the judge's behest or both? They're done under court order. I have done other work retained by counsel, but when it's through the juvenile court uh, or the juvenile court clinics, it's always directly by order of the court. The judge has asked that an evaluation be done not for one side or for the other, but for the court's purposes. That's correct. Now, <clears throat> Doctor, um, I think I sort of skipped over this, but can you describe any licensures that you hold at this time? Yes, I'm admitted to the bar as an attorney in Massachusetts, uh, but my primary work in psychology is covered under three licenses. I'm licensed in New Hampshire and Massachusetts and Texas. And Doctor, um, can you explain to us what uh, the certificate program means to be a designated forensic professional, a designated forensic mental health supervisor, and a designated juvenile court clinician? Some years ago, the trial court and the Department of Mental Health decided to implement a process of education and training for people who would be doing court-ordered evaluations in, uh, in, in the trial court. On the adult side, these people are called designated profe uh, forensic professionals, DFPs. They are uh, doctoral level psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, on the juvenile side, they are called certified juvenile court clinicians. I have been trained both as a DFP and as a CJCC, as they are called, and I'm also qualified to serve as, essentially as a supervisor or instructor uh, for those who are in training to earn those certifications. And how far back does your designation go? May I check my CV? Sure. <laughs> I know the designated forensic professional goes back probably to the mid to late 1980s, but I'll, I'll, let me just check here briefly. And I'm sorry, if you have a page. A uh, page two. Page two, thank you. Uh, designated forensic professional from 1993 and ongoing. Designated forensic mental health supervisor from 1994 and still ongoing. And since 2001, uh, an ongoing designated juvenile court clinician and mentor. Levels one and two. Levels one and two uh, differentiate between um, those cases which uh, are routinely before the juvenile court uh, but do not always have specific legal questions before them. Uh, level two designates specific training and competency to stand trial and criminal responsibility evaluations. And Dr. Kinsherf, um, do you also do writing and research? 